among the flowers and the hills, lived an engineer and his name was Bogus Bill. You could tell him by the whistle every time you heard it blow. Musical engineer on the CCNO. Left Irwin, Tennessee at half past nine. Schedule work for Spartanburg, South Carolina. Fireman McLean said we will be delayed. Shovel on the cold through the 558. Fogless Bill sitting at the throttle. Fogless Bill on the CCNO. Fogless Bill sitting at the throttle. Fogless Bill on the CCNO. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Corbin Hazlett. In 1927, the band, The Hillbillies, with East Tennessean fiddlin Charlie Bowman, recorded the CCNO number 558, a tribute to J. Fred Leonard, or Fogless Bill, a beloved engineer on the Carolina, Clinchfield, and Ohio Railway, whose distinctive musical whistle blows were components of the daily sensory experience in and around Irwin, Tennessee. The Hillbillies recorded a remembrance of one of many sounds that ebbed and flowed with the daily life in an East Tennessee railroad town, born out of the Clinchfield Railroad, Irwin. Our project, Remembering, Recording, and Reimagining Life in a Railroad Town, dealt with Irwin, Tennessee, located on the banks of the Nolichucky River near the North Carolina border in Unicoi County. Irwin, Unicoi County seat, is located within the Johnson City Metropolitan Statistical Area and also within the Tri-Cities Statistical Area. The Appalachian Regional Commission currently lists the town of 6,000 as at risk, a status it was only recently given and a status that may change with current issues within Irwin. Good morning, I'm Kathy Furness and I'm gonna introduce you to our oral history project on the Clinchfield Railroad. My colleagues and I are the second year of this project, which is a partnership between ETSU and the Appalachian Teaching Project. Now, this project was the work of many hearts and hands besides ours. We worked with our community partners, as well as our narrators, of course, and people in the community, and Dr. Ron Roach. Now, our goals were not only to collect oral histories on the history of the railroad, as well as its ability to become an economic engine in the region, but also to work with the community on plans for using that railroad history to develop cultural heritage tourism. Now, these were our key activities. We conducted a great deal of research on the railroad, as well as the community of Irwin. We evaluated resources such as the Clinchfield Railroad Museum and the George L. Carter Railroad Museum, and we conducted eight interviews that yielded more than 11 hours of oral history. Now, our narrators came from several generations of railroad families. Some grew up in the Depression, others in the boom years of Irwin, which were the 50s, and those were years that our, one of our narrators, Mr. Thornberry, remembered like this. Irwin was a melting pot, a boom town, a noisy place. The railroad had wreck whistles, whistles to come to work, and trains going to the Feldspar mills, the lumber mill, the textile mill, and the pottery. Now, oral history projects are, are history. They're supposed to focus on the past, and that's how ours started. But our project took a very surprising turn, and we found ourselves witnessing the start of a new chapter in the railroad history and that's going to affect the future of the community and the outcome of this project. Hello, I'm Jen Bingham. And although Unicoi County was established in 1875, the region had its true birth in 1908 when coal magnate George L. Carter decided to headquarter his new railroad in the town of Irwin. The population of Irwin doubled between 1910 and 1920 and continued to grow until 1960. 
The Carolina Clinchfield and Ohio Railway was the only north-south connector between the coal fields of Virginia and the textile mills of South Carolina. The mountainous route demanded high standards of engineering and construction, with 55 tunnels and numerous cuts and fills over its 277 miles. The construction cost a great deal in terms of both money and human lives, and the curves and, and tunnels weren't necessarily comfortable after their completion either. And uh, the man whose picture is on the screen, who is an amazing person, he had his 95th birthday before we, um, before we interviewed him. His name is George, George Hatcher. He's a former Clinchfield engineer and fireman. And he recalled that there is a tunnel, Sandy Ridge Tunnel, two miles long. It got very, very hot in there. And you'd be on the second or third steam engine going about five or six miles an hour and have to breathe all that steam and smoke. Despite the expense and discomfort, the exacting construction standards meant that very little of the route needed to be altered over the course of a century. It's still a viable rail route. While the Clinchfield route was primarily used for coal haulage, it also hosted limited passenger service from 1909 until the mid-20th century. From 1968 to 1979, they resurrected the passenger trains in the form of a series of popular scenic day excursions pulled by the restored Clinchfield No. 1 steam engine. And the longest running special train is the Santa train, um, and it has delivered gifts annually along the route since 1942. In addition to building a rail system to fill a specific transport need, the CCNO actively recruited industry and workers to Irwin. Good morning, I'm Susan Brown, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of Irwin as far as the industrial development went, the CCNO's model, and how that affected um, community identity. So of course they had the passenger service, but they also serviced industries that were already present in Irwin. The um, National Fish, ha Fish, Fish Hatchery came in in the 1890s, it's still there today. Um, they serviced uh, an orchard from Alta Pass, North Carolina. There's still orchards in and around Irwin and in Utiquoy County. But one of the uh, most important things they did to influence the development of Irwin is they recruited industries. You see some um, silk mill workers here um, from back in the day. They had two lumber companies, Vestal Lumber and Liberty Lumber. Um, and the other thing that they brought in were two Velspar plants. And this was an important strategy because Feldspar, they had really good clay in the area to make pottery. Feldspar is needed to make pottery. So bringing those in helped them bring in the biggest um, recruiting industry that they had, which was southern potteries. They were there for over 40 years. Um, they made it a really beautiful um, pottery design called Blue Ridge Pottery. We have a book on our table if you want to see what it looks like. Um, this is an agreement between the CCNO on the slide and uh, the pottery to put a spur of the rail line out to them so that they could put pottery on and off to be shipped in and out. They also brought in a New York architect and he developed a model residential area in Irwin. A lot of these pottery houses are still there. And this is Lou Thornberry. He's the gentleman I had the privilege to talk to. He lives in one of these pottery houses today. His father was on one of the first trains in in 1917. He was a potter from West Virginia, I believe. They also came in from Ohio. Um, and he helped me understand why Irwin sees itself as a railroading town, maybe as opposed to a pottery town. And you had the big sawmill going out at Vestal Lumber. They had wood for two or three blocks, big stacks of wood, and the trains coming into the pottery, the trains coming into the sawmill, and the trains coming into the feldspar plant. So no matter where you worked in Irwin, the CCNO was at the center of all of that. Good morning, my name is Emily Presnell, and I would like to talk a little bit more about life in Irwin. Um, during the CCNO days, the railroad helped build the community. It helped shape the families. It helped in building the local YMCA, local high school, several churches, and hospitals. And it, donated some of that land for those buildings as well. The railroad helped shape in, on, here we go, <laughs> helped shape the family by which neighborhoods they lived in, depending on where their families would work. One of the, um, what you see on the screen is several of the pottery houses, which are also known as model communities being constructed there. Men were often absent for long periods of time. Um, 
George Hatcher, one of our narrators, recalls being away for at least 30 days. Train whistles were often heard um, in Irwin. It couldn't be seen as a form of communication. And Charlotte Edwards, one of our narrators, remembers this. You know, some of the men had special whistles. When we called Grandpa Harvey had one. When he'd go out at night, he'd play good night, sweetheart, telling his wife good night. Good morning, my name is James Elias. I'm gonna talk about the interviews process with you. Um, they were conducted at the Unicoi County Welcome Center and, and uh, also at the Career Center opened up by ETSU faculty member and director of the Unicoi County Joint Economic Development Board, Tish, Tish Oldham. Our, our, our narrators generally revealed nostalgic memories of life on the railroad, but with the good comes the bad, and life on the railroad, especially in the early days, was very dangerous. Um, the narrator I interviewed, he's a lifelong railroader, his name is Carl Thomas, revealed that after witnessing a death in his shop, he sought an early retirement. Uh, an additional narrator, uh, Charlotte Edwards, she lost her father as a young girl to a railroad accident. When asked about safety regulations, Mr. Thomas expressed the idea that safety regulations gradually increased over his 38-year career, career on the railroad and accident files from the Clinchfield Railroad collection in the archives of Appalachia provided concrete evidence to back up those claims. And uh, In addition to the work hazards, the Clinchfield Railroad was also subjected to labor strikes. Uh, Sonny Brotherton recalled laborers going on strikes in order for the company to uh, notice the needs of the workers. And Brotherton also mentions that the management was called in to perform the labor of the striking workers. Uh, Carl Thomas also supports that recollection. And despite uh, hazardous work and conditions and labor strife, the Clinchfield Railroad was uh, known to be a company that took care of their employees. And Carl Thomas reminds us that it was more or less like a big family. Good morning, my name is Rebecca Prophet. On October 15th, 2015, around the time we conducted our first interviews in the community, the sound of the railroad was suddenly and unexpectedly silenced in Irwin, ending more than a century of railroad operations in the town. Throughout its long history, the CCNO has undergone many changes. Our narrators recalled the transfer of the railroad to the Chessie Seaboard expansion in 1983 and the ways that that change altered the dynamics of the town. Speaking on the closure of the Chessie Seaboard expansion, Mark Stevens, co-author of two books on Irwin's Railroad said, this isn't just the loss of an industry in Irwin, as devastating as that is. Uh, the loss goes to the very psyche of the town and its people. A century of work and love and identity was suddenly and unexpectedly changed forever, and it is, for me, profoundly sad. With the sudden loss of Irwin's longest serving industry and 300 jobs from nearby communities, local leaders are acting quickly to provide support and a vision for the future. An emergency response team was sent by the Workforce Investment Board to assist former CSX employees in job searching and to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the impact of the closing. Additionally, East Tennessee State University has opened a career center in Unicoi County. A movement to buy the 175-acre rail yard and some surrounding buildings is already underway and a task force is taking steps to recruit industry to the area. Community members are enthusiastic about using the rail line and the county's rich railroad heritage to enhance tourism, including the possibility of bringing back the Clinchfield No. 1 for passenger excursions along the historic and scenic route through the mountains. Good morning, my name is Nikki Johnson. Uh, when thinking about a uh, vision for the future of Irwin and Unicoi County, a quote from a narrator, Martha Irwin, comes to mind. Every year you have to have a vision. You have to have, every year I have a vision, you have to have a vision. In addition to collecting oral history, our second goal was to help the communi community utilize this history to stimulate economic growth. There are several recommendations using the county's railroad history that can be used to enhance cultural tourism. Exploring this possibility of bringing back excursion trains became one of the top recommendations during this time of change. Board member Aaron McClellan stated, it would be a pretty ride and most people have never seen it. Irwin um, Mayor and Unicoi County Mayor are currently discussing um, sending a delegate to Jacksonville, Florida to possibly purchase the 175 acre CSX rail yard for industrial and commercial development. Unicoi County Mayor 
uh, stated in an article, our fate remains in their hands. Other recommendations other recommendations for the community's future include utilizing technology, improving signage, both to promote and support the Clinchfield Railroad and Heritage Museums. In a recent article, the mayor of the town of Unicoi quoted, we have been through big losses of industry and jobs before, including at the CSX, and we have rebounded. I think we can do it again. Beyond learning all the techniques of ethnographic work, we gained something larger from this course. We learned about the perseverance of the human spirit from our direct contact with the community. Because of the CSX closure, there is an increased relevance to our project. This devastating blow to the economic standing of the area leads to opportunity for this class to utilize the rich cultural resource and give this community a renewed sense of hope for the future. We could not have done this project without our narrators, and the community. I'm Savannah, I'm from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about the, uh, the strikes that you were mentioning. I forget which of you were discussing the railroad strikes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why they went on strike, the purpose of them? Were they fighting for wages? Were they fighting for better work environments? Can you just elaborate on that a little bit more? Yes, of course. James was actually talking about the strikes, but the gentleman who he was referring to was one of the fellows who I got the chance to interview. Uh, his name was Sonny Brotherton. He spent about 30 or 35 years on the railroad, and he was actually one of the organizers for uh, the section of the union he was within. He, he told us that um, within jobs in the railroad, there were different unions for each job level, pretty much. Like there was a union for men who worked in the shops, a union for men who were firemen, engineers, different sections. And he was a little vague about it because he, you know, I think he, he didn't want to he didn't want to give a bad impression of the railroad he had worked for for so long, but he did imply that it was for better wages at that instance, and usually that was what they would strike for. Um, and, and he also told us that unions were encouraged by the railroad. They, they were encouraged because the Clinchfield seemed to be the kind of railroad and the kind of corporation that preferred to deal on a more even plane with their employees. So. Uh, with this one instance, he, he told us that, you know, um, he had got a call from the folks at the union down in Jacksonville, and they said, you got to go on strike. All this is going on with another railroad. So they went on strike, and he went home for the day, and he said they called him all through the night. His phone must have rang 200, 300 times, and he wouldn't answer it. So finally, um, one of the folks actually came to his door and pretty much told him, look, Sonny, we know you want better wages. Let's just talk. We'll give you the wages because apparently whenever uh, the workers would go on strike, management had to do the job. And you know most of the folks who had been in the offices didn't really know how to fire a steam engine. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was kind of the gist of that, that one in particular union account. OK. Hi, I'm Tina Sadowski. I'm also from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And I was just kind of wondering how you chose your sample, how did you decide who to interview, and like exactly how many people did you interview? <laughs> our, our sample came from, um, it kind of gets down to the, um, we're gonna say sur surviving longtime employees of the Clinchfield Railroad, and their, um, people who had lived in the community before that. We had a great deal of help from Martha Irwin, who is at the Clinchfield, or the Unicoi County Heritage Museum and the Clinchfield Railroad Museum. Um, she knew a lot of people in the community. She grew up in the community. She was one of our narrators. And um, we had hoped to, since the, CSX, the CSX closed the Irwin operation in the middle of our project, we were really hoping that we'd have a chance to interview some people who were affected directly by that. Unfortunately, it proved to be a little too recent for them to want to talk about it. 
So we, um, we really focused on the, the historical aspect of it. There were eight total narrators. Um, I don't know exact ranges, but our oldest was 95 years old and had been working on the railroad since 1941, um, retired in the, I believe, with the transition in 1983. So. Uh, hi, my name is Luke Mafriga, also from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I was just curious, during uh, one of your quotes that mentioned uh, like smoke inhalation, I was wondering, uh, were there any like concerns of like health issues brought up during these interviews that like these people might have been suffering from? <laughs> Safety on the railroad wasn't a big concern, just like in any kind of industrial industry, the turn of the century and up through the 20th century. Um, like my interviewer or my narrator that I interviewed, he he said that the changes came gradually. Um, he he recalled uh, getting metal shavings in his eyes on the rivet gang, and his foreman told him to wash his eyes out and put some Vaseline on it and get back to work. Um, like I, there was multiple deaths on the railroad. It wasn't a big concern. Um, they didn't. There wasn't a push for safety regulation at any time. It just gradually was implemented into the the industry. And I am Rachel, also from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And my question is, did your interviewees express concern about how the history was going to be recorded and if the, like, the legacy of CCNO would continue? Um, actually, the person that we talked to, uh, Emily and I, Lou Thornberry, was one of the few narrators who did not work for the railroad. He was involved with the pottery. Um, so I can't speak to that from the, the person that I talked to individually. Um, I do think that, that the community is concerned that they're going to lose their identity with the, the railroad pulling out of there. Um, it is a concern that came up in a lot of the interviews. I know Martha Irwin from the Unicoi County Heritage Museum a lot of times she talks about, you know, the, the railroad is why the town is here. Um, and so it was very damaging just psychologically um, in addition to them losing the jobs that, you know, they're, they're going to lose who they are when the, when the railroad goes away. To add on to that, I think it's good to just kind of give a little context to Irwin today as well. The population is currently around 6,000, but if you look at numbers now compared to the census in 2010, uh, the population of the county and the town have both steadily decreased over the past five years. And with the 300 plus jobs that were hit directly in Irwin, a very small community, I'm sure this will be even more effectual in the future. So as, as she said, a lot of our, our interviewers, they did speak directly to that. And I think it really is going to become apparent here in the near future. So, Do we have any other questions for, for the group? I am uh, Brandon Marksberry from Moorhead State University. Uh, unionization was a contentious issue in our recent uh, governor's election in Kentucky. Uh, I was wondering if your interviews with these, these people actually changed or uh, strengthened your opinions on unionization, any? Um, if you could just comment on how you feel about unionization, railroads. Uh. Well, I would... <laughs> I would definitely start out by saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the two, the two elements of unionization and, and even the word union itself is just a completely different can of worms, you know, in East Kentucky, when, whereas it was in Irwin, Tennessee. I mean, within the railroad, I think the railroad was somewhat more a contained operation. I mean, as most, you know, coal companies did have complete power over their own communities and all, the... The Clinchfield did as well, however, it seemed to be a little more generous and forgiving to their employees. And really, Sonny was the only interviewer who spoke much any about unions. And obviously, from what we said, it was fairly mild. And that was one thing he said, uh, was that working for the, the Clinchfield was far better than any other railroad job. He said there were always people transferring from the Southern, from the ET and WNC, a bunch of other local railroads. It was kind of like the Clinchfield was the one to go to. And so I, 
I would say with unions, our perspective may be a little skewed just because things on the clinch field were really good, you could say. But um, I, as I mentioned before, I think it is interesting to note that the Clinchfield Railroad did encourage unions. They, they wanted their workers to have a say. They wanted a direct connection to the workers where they could actually sit down face to face and have communication on a more even plane. Okay, let's give a round of applause to ETSU for their work. Great job.